All right, hello. Uh, here is our attempt to record a video lecture. Uh, please keep in mind that it's not a substitute for you reading the chapter. I will provide the basic overview of the topics uh, related to uh, change, innovation, and entrepreneurship. But please spend your time, read the chapter, and uh, come prepared for a Thursday class. Uh, you will find it definitely beneficial. Uh, we're going to start by uh, talking about what the change really is and why it matters. Um, let me see if I can get the technology to cooperate. So um, basically, uh, we'll talk about the forces for change, where the change is coming from, and how do we respond to it, types and forms of change, uh, managing for innovation, managing change, and helping people uh, adopt to the change and stop resistance. Uh, we'll, from that, switch to the notion of entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship and talk about different kinds of it. And then we'll talk a little bit about the entrepreneurial process and um, that will wrap up our session. Uh, by the time we meet on Thursday, I expect you to fully read the chapter, the things that I choose to not speak during this presentation, including. And uh, we'll have our regular uh, quiz at the beginning of the session, uh, so the first 10 minutes of the class. So again, please be prepared for that. Uh, let's start with the notion of change, right, and where it comes from. Uh, there are several possible sources for the organizational change, and uh, the majority of them come from the external environment. Right, so whenever anything changes economically, demographically, that probably means that uh, the organization will need to respond. If you remember, early on we talked about the general segments of the external environment and how changes in those segments create opportunities and threats for all firms in uh, all industries. So what it means uh, for us, for instance, right, there's a global change. Right now there's a uh, global negotiations with China, whether or not there'll be tariffs imposed, depending on how those turn out. Many organizations in the U.S. may or may not have to change to, to think out their uh, change in strategy. And, um, you know, that's definitely something they need to keep in mind. Uh, economically, if there's an economic growth in this country, that probably means that some industries will be doing a lot better. That will probably mean that uh, businesses that pursue differentiation strategy and not so much cost leadership strategy would be doing well. Um, and, um, you know, those other businesses may have to think the change of their strategy or structure. But apart from that, apart from external changes, there could also be internal environment changes that affect how our organizations approach what it is that they do. Uh, it is quite possible that, uh, you know, your research and development department will come up with a new innovation that will uh, enable you to pursue an opportunity that uh, you weren't able to pursue before. And if that happens, then, you know, by all means, you'll need to reorganize the company, you'll need to uh, raise the resources, you'll need to hire people, you'll need to engage in strong marketing campaign. So the changes, even though we tend to think that most of them are initiated by the external environment that will respond to whatever happens outside, they may equally well be explained by what happens inside of the company. And in that case, we are not necessarily responding to the change, but we are bringing the change into the external environment. So rather than being reactive, we are being proactive. And that's, uh, I guess, very true for entrepreneurial companies. Um, technology in general is very important for understanding the changes within a business and innovations. Uh, technologies develop uh, following a particular cycle model, right? They are born, they mature, they, uh, they decline, and at some point they die. So uh, if you are a technological company, it is critically important for you to understand at what stage the technology currently is, uh, to understand the adoption pattern, and uh, that will help you plan your strategy because, uh, you know, if the technology is in a decline, 
Uh, it makes very little sense to keep investing in it. You need to harvest what the technology provides, but uh, essentially that's all. If the technology is young, it, you have a lot of incentives to uh, play with it, to try to develop your technology into the dominant standard, but you also need to uh, acknowledge that uh, someone else's technology may become a dominant standard, and uh, so your investments are risky. There is always this relationship between innovation and risk uh, that entrepreneurs and corporations, and they have to take into account. And uh, so there's also this notion of the next generation technology. This is not quite as radical a thing as a technology cycle where the old technology gets obsolete and is replaced by another one. Here we talk about uh, gradual changes to the available technology, uh, incremental improvement of what the technology enables. So, uh, you know, think about uh, iPhones. Uh, when iPhone, when Apple releases a new generation of iPhones, it doesn't mean that all the old ones are obsolete. Right? So, uh, I actually still have at home a, an iPad, the first generation iPad uh, that uh, my two year old now uses to watch cartoons. You can no longer update it. Uh, the, the iOS uh, is actually so old that you cannot really do anything. But for now, you know, he can watch uh, YouTube and he seems to be enjoying. So, uh, but whenever there is this next generation of technology, again, it means that uh, certain modifications have to uh, occur and uh, you need to plan change in your business accordingly. Um, there are four basic types of change that organization can endure. One is change in strategy. So uh, imagine the organization initially could be pursuing a cost leadership strategy to get a foothold in the market. When Hyundai cars just entered the US market, they were primarily competing as cost leaders. They needed to establish themselves as reliable players, so they, they provided this 10 year, 100,000 mile warranty, but they were priced very competitively. Once they have established themselves as reliable leaders, they started to change their business level strategy more towards differentiation. And this is how Genesis was born. Initially, it was just one of the models of the Hyundai make. They now actually had made it into a separate brand. And um, so that's, that's a major change in strategy. It could also be a change in structure, right? If you're a domestic company and all of a sudden you start exporting your stuff to uh, Europe or Asia, Maybe you need a separate division. Maybe you need a division, a uh, global division, or maybe a European division or Asian division, or you know any, anything like that. Um, if you diversify, you probably need to rethink your structure as well. Um, I think the textbook gives an example of a Google corporation that uh, at some point has decided that it needed a new parent corporation, so the alphabet. Right, so rather than trying to structure other businesses under it, uh, it actually has created this umbrella corporation that uh, helps it coordinate its activities uh, in, in all the markets where it chooses to compete. Changes in technology, obviously, we talked about that already, but there could be also change in, changes in people. Right? So as organizations hire new employees, they may bring with them new skills, they may train employees to receive new skills. Uh, there is a very strong trend towards e-learning and electronic training. Uh, there's the proliferation of MOOCs, those massive open online courses where employees could stay relevant without really paying much uh, to do that. Uh, that leads to changes in performance for those employees and that also may involve changes in organizational culture. Where certain things which were not encouraged before are now encouraged, certain things that were not possible are now possible. So that all is considered to be changes in people. And um, um, when it comes to organizational changes, especially as far as technology is concerned, we may talk about two different forms of change. We may talk about the incremental change, 
which is largely, you know, like a process improvement. Uh, it could be just minor modification, tweaking to what the company does. Um, you know, think about this generational change uh, that we talked about before. Uh, the second type of change is a lot more radical. Uh, it's called discontinuous. And this is where you actually introduce new products, new services that are not exactly compatible with what we've been doing before. These kind of changes can completely destroy the foundation for your or someone else's competitive advantage. And for that reason, they are very risky. But uh, if you do them right, the payoff is definitely high. So um, uh, you manage them differently, obviously. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Uh, the technology adoption curve, something that I've mentioned before already, you need to understand at what stage the technology you're working with uh, currently is. Most new technologies don't make it, they do not get adopted, they do not become uh, de facto standards. In fact, uh, of all the innovation attempts and R&D projects, only about 16% succeed, and uh, only about 1% succeed really big time. So when you look at a particular technology, if the technology is young, right, you know that this very minor segment of people, very tiny chunk uh, that would even consider adopting it, the so-called innovators, just about two and a half percent of all users would qualify as innovators. Then come early adopters, 13 and a half percent. So altogether, they are responsible for about 16% of users and uh, you know, if you know that, if you've noticed that your technology develops along this specific adoption curve, you can probably expect that an early majority will come and late majority will come. But if too many people have adopted the technology, you know that you only have laggards, just the remaining 16% uh, who you may try to reach. And once that happens, now the technology will probably become obsolete. Innovators will go for something else. Early adopters will follow. So depending on where you are along this adoption curve, you may or may not want to consider investing in this technology and changing the organization to actually get something uh, out of it. Um, if you decide to change the organization, in order to manage for innovation. There are certain organizational structures that are known to work best. First of all, you wanna have a flat organization with limited bureaucracy. So I believe I told you that at some point, General Electric had 27 layers of management. And that is definitely not sustainable if you wanna have an innovating company. So for information, for the information to reach the top level of organization from the bottom where a problem is noticed, just imagine 27 steps going up and then 27 steps going down once a particular decision is made. So uh, you definitely want an organization that is flat, that is agile, where information can reach the decision makers very fast. You wanna have a generalist division of labor. So what happens here is that uh, people who, um, um, specialists, you know, think about accountants and finance, they usually do not make very good entrepreneurs. Uh, they have very good corporate careers, they specialize in a particular thing, but when it comes to, uh, you know, being able to solve problems, to, to get the resources, to come up with a creative solution, it's usually generalists who do better than specialists. And for that reason, if you also, if you put a team together, uh, you want to make sure that it's a cross-functional team. If you do have a number of specialists, you want to make sure that all those different functions are represented. So it's not just R&D, but also marketing, and you know, supply people, and sales, and, and all of that to make sure that the organization is flexible enough, so flexibility is key, 
and the information flow is a uh, sort of broad and wide. And uh, finally, uh, a lot of time uh, to get successful innovation introduced, you need what's known as Scumworks projects. So these are, you know, just, just independent teams working on specific projects with a lot of autonomy. Oftentimes they are located away from the mother corporation. Uh, there is a sense of exclusivity uh, and many successful corporations have that. They bring together their best and brightest. Uh, they enable them to work on projects of great promise. And if it works out, I guess everybody wins. Um, for the organization to be successfully innovating, uh, you want to encourage an innovative culture, which includes encouragement of risk-taking, flexibility, and open systems. So open systems refers to this idea that, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have all the brightest people in the world working for your company. And great ideas with value for your company or for your customers may come from elsewhere. So you actually open a look outside of your organizational borders for those ideas. And you also try to find the best use for your own ideas outside of the organization if you cannot implement them yourselves. Right, so you open up this innovation process that creates multiple opportunities for technology commercialization and brings, to, brings with it uh, multiple sources of innovative opportunities that you can pursue. Uh, when you are dealing with the incremental change, you adopt what's known as a compression approach. This is the generation change. You simply try to, uh, I guess, speed up the replacement of older technology with its newer version so that you stay relevant, you stay uh, right at the forefront. And um, also by doing so, you kind of keep competitors at bay, right? Because even if they replicate what you've already done, by the time they release it to the market, you've already done something else. Um, you think about companies like uh, Intel and uh, AMD, so they both are producing uh, microprocessors. Intel for the longest while has been an uh, industry leader. It would come up with new processors uh, released to the market. And uh, AMD will reverse engineer them and reintroduce its own version to that same market about six months later. Because of the threat of imitation, it was critically important for Intel to keep coming up with new technologies which is exactly what it did. So, uh, you know, this compression approach is something that you need if you're dealing with incremental change. If you're dealing with a discontinuous change or radical change, then you need to engage in the experimental approach. So here, you don't really know how successful you're gonna be. You start multiple projects, you invest in several new initiatives, hoping that some of them will actually uh, you know, result in a commercial viable and successful product. Uh, here we don't talk about generational change. We really talk about some risk taking and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and uh, there's openness to outside ideas or to external ways of commercializing your ideas becomes very important. People usually are quite resistant to change they uh, start with denial. They do not want to recognize that things are about to change. Once they realize that the change is real, they resist, right? Later on, they explore them. Hey, maybe, maybe there is some truth to, to that. I actually remember uh, I had major difficulties adopting this whole online trading. You know, I initially thought it was ridiculous. Then I tried staying away from it. Uh, you know, then I realized you actually could get a lot out of it. And now I'm fully committed. So, uh, you know, the same process happens at the organizational level whenever there's a major change. Um, there are multiple reasons for people's resistance to change. Uncertainty, right? you don't know what it's gonna bring. You are concerned. You don't know, so the learning anxiety you don't know if you'll be able to learn the new system. When I was making a switch from the Windows computer to a MacBook, I had tons of learning anxiety, you know, 
learning new operating system is a is a challenge, or at least for me, it was a challenge. So uh, I just remember the feeling. Self-interest. Um, if you are good at something and your organization values you for it, you don't want change. You don't want your leadership position or unique position to potentially go away. So, uh, you know, you kind of resist. You fear of loss, right? You fear that uh, maybe the organization will not even need you. Or maybe you wouldn't be so specially valuable, so uh, you would lose whatever leverage you had with them. Loss of control, right? Maybe the control will, someone else will be a gatekeeper. You will become just one of many, and you know, maybe, maybe you'll be seen as obsolete. And finally, that's sort of a uh, slightly different animal. Um, if you've developed habits that have seen you successful up to this point, it's very hard psychologically to uh, actually change, right? Because um, it's, it's an experience that has reaffirmed itself. You've been successful doing that previously. Why change? So there is the psychological mechanism that prevents you from making a change. And uh, so there are several ways of overcoming resistance. Uh, I wouldn't go over them now, so please uh, read them out in the textbook. Same with this resistance to change matrix. Uh, please spend time reading about it uh, on your own. And same with the change model, right? There are two models that the textbook talks about. So uh, yeah, do that, uh, figure it out. Um, what I want to spend a few more minutes on is this notion of entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurs are often seen as agents of change and people behind innovation, but unfortunately it has become one of the most used, misused and abused uh, terms in, uh, I guess, in a business language. Uh, when we talk about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs, right, we talk so entrepreneurship implies this nexus of individuals and opportunities. There has to be a person pursuing an opportunity. There has, and the opportunity, as you remember, has to do with change in the external environment or internal environment, whatever the case might be, right? So there is an individual or a group of individuals trying to pursue a specific opportunity that has to do with change. And because of that, it often involves um, innovation. Uh, typically, entrepreneurs are seen as creating new businesses, and oftentimes entrepreneurship itself is defined as the creation of new ventures. But they could also be creating new lines of businesses within existing corporations. And in that case, they are known as corporate entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. Uh, they are very different from, uh, I guess, traditional entrepreneurs. And the major differences, well, there are two major differences. The risks are much lower to them. They do not put their own financial well-being on the line when they try to come up with a new line of business within an established corporation. Right? So the risk that is so uh, critical in shaping the world of an entrepreneur is not really a big factor there. There is a risk to the organization, but not to the corporate entrepreneur himself or herself. And two is obviously access to resources. Most new ventures um, fail to grow because they do not have the resources, and four out of five new startups fail within four years, again, because, uh, well, partly because they just didn't have the resources to grow. So when you try to grow through corporate entrepreneurship, uh, you have the back end of the mother corporation. Obviously, that's a very different story. Um, as a corporate entrepreneur, pretty much any entrepreneur actually, uh, there are three things that, that most of them uh, have in common. And, um, this has to do with the so-called entrepreneurial orientation. Uh, organizations that are entrepreneurially oriented are said to be innovative, risk-taking, and proactive. And of course, you know that not every organization meets this description. 
And for that reason, it is so inadequate when, you know, any company manager is called an entrepreneur. Now, uh, there is a saying that entrepreneurship ends where management begins. So as long as there is this innovativeness, risk-taking, and proactiveness remaining in the company, you may talk about it as an entrepreneurial company. Otherwise, it's just, you know, a going concern. It's, uh, it's an organization that uh, serves its customers, but uh, that's, that's really that. The entrepreneurial function then uh, sort of stops its work unless there is this drive towards innovativeness. Then there's also this uh, specific kind of entrepreneurs uh, known as uh, franchisees that they wanted to spend uh, a few minutes on. So usually entrepreneurs either create or discover some opportunities that then they then choose to exploit. There is this other kind of business arrangement where this opportunity discovery is actually induced by the original entrepreneur who has come up with a specific resource combination. I think about buying maybe a uh, subway uh, franchise. So some original owner has figured out how to organize everything, what kind of markets it's good for, and they are willing to let you use that specific combination of resources provide you with a uh, you know, marketing support and training and whatnot um, to let you exploit the same opportunity. Does it make you an entrepreneur? That's a big question. And uh, there's no straightforward answer. Uh, in my personal opinion, yes, this is still entrepreneurial. There is still some risk involved. Uh, there is still a significant amount of resources that uh, franchisees must bring to the table to pursue the opportunity. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are important distinctions as well. And again, entrepreneurship ends where management begins. This path from entrepreneur to manager is probably a lot shorter for franchisees than for typical entrepreneurs. And then finally, then the entrepreneurial process. Right, it consists of four major steps, I would say. One is selecting the new venture. Right? We need to be able to answer uh, what type of business and what industry and with what competitive advantage we're going to start. We have to plan the new venture. And that involves uh, traditional business plans, uh, a more recently developed business models, or even business canvas, right? This easy, easy representation of what it is that you're gonna do and how you're gonna be making money. Financing new venture uh, is another important thing. Um, you know, you have to figure out how much money you actually need and whether or not you need external money. And once you've decided how much you need, you need to look at the sources. Most new ventures are financed by, by what's called three Fs, friends, family, and fools. Um, we like to think about uh, venture capitalists as providing financial support to new ventures, but uh, you know there's only about uh, 3,000 new ventures that receive VC funding in the States every year, and that's for 300 plus million people. So the chances of getting VC funding are very minor, and you don't need to fool yourself, so you have to be thinking strategically about the kind of opportunity you are pursuing and whether or not that is the right source of funding for you. And, um, you know, if you are, if you do end up seeking external funding, you need to be able to boil down your basic entrepreneurial message to the so-called elevator pitch, right? A two minute version of your, uh, I guess, value proposition, explaining how you're gonna be making money and why someone should invest. Once you have those things figured out, assuming you've raised the money, it's also important to control the venture. And this is something that many entrepreneurs forget to do. They are too excited about innovation. They are too excited about the change. Controlling is boring, right? So they try to uh, not really engage into it too deeply. Uh, but the thing is, uh, you know, without control, there's no future. 
there are all sorts of uh, opportunities for uh, abuse and misuse of resources, which are very scarce uh, for the new venture. So controlling is essential. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, end my mini lecture. I invite you to read the chapter and, um, you know, just come prepared. Reading all the things that uh, I chose not to talk, I have identified those. Um, we'll, we'll definitely have a conversation on what I've covered and what has left uh, beyond this mini lecture. All right. Thank you, guys, and I'll see you Thursday.